So again, thanks for coming to my workshop, uh, which is going to be about, I guess, as a group, writing some examples of using Julia to simulate quantum systems. Um, so we're going to start doing some simple examples that are small and try and move on to bigger things that are more complicated. Uh, so my impression is, from having people talk to me and looking at the attendee list, that most people here are not physicists. Am I right about that? Um, put up your hand if you're a physicist. There are a few. Um, okay, uh, put up your hand if you've ever taken quantum mechanics. Um, a little bit? Cool. Put up your hand if you know linear algebra, which is the only real prerequisite for this. Um, so hopefully uh, one thing that will become clear is that um, really what a lot of physicists are very good at doing is, is attaching a bunch of words to simple linear algebra concepts to make them sound more complicated than they are. Uh, <laughs> So if you get confused and you're not sure what's going on, um, a good question to ask would be, hold on, can you explain how this is actually a simple linear algebra that I already know? Because I almost guarantee that it will be. Um, so what we're going to need for this uh, is a cloned copy of my repo, which should be public for this. So it comes in a set of five Jupyter notebooks. Um, and the URL is github.com, KS Hyatt, JuliaCon 2017. Um, I'll highlight that up there. Hopefully everyone can see that. Um, so to run the notebooks, you can either run them locally on your computer, um, which will work fine if you, especially if you have like a, a good um, laptop with a bunch of CPUs in it, since we're, we are going to add procs at one point during this. Um, or if you don't want to do it on your computer, uh, you can go to dev.juliabox.com, which may or may not show up, or you can just click the link. Um, and that they have uh, a little mini cluster set up for everybody who wants to use it. Thank you very much to the Julia computer, computing folks who did that. Uh, I don't know if I can see you in the back, but you are all amazing. Um, and you'll also need Julia 0.6. Uh, and finally, if you're running it locally, um, we're going to use two packages, gr.jl. Um, and hdf5.jl, so that's what everybody will need. Um, oh, stop for seating and sitting down. Um, cool. Sorry. Okay, uh, so doo -doo -doo. I will open up my own Jupyter Notebooks situation here. Um, just going to get these guys. Sorry? <laughs> um, yeah, so if, if you're using Julia Box, it might take a little bit. Um, hopefully, it starts up quickly. Um, can people, I don't know if putting up your hand when you're ready is maybe the best thing to do. Um, how many people are, are ready to go right now? Most people are not. Okay, I will wait then. Um, this can also be deleted. Are other people able to successfully connect to Julia Box? Oh, ah, is that the issue that Julia Box is not loading? Yeah, no. Ooh. <laughs> um, <laughs> well, okay. So if if Julia Box isn't working, the only part we really need multiple CPUs for are the last two, which we may not get to anyway. Um, so in the meantime, uh, if you want to just run your own Jupyter Notebooks server uh, for the first three parts, that'll definitely be sufficient. Um, and hopefully Julia Box will connect by that time. Uh, is it just like not loading or weird? Has anybody successfully managed to get into it? Uh, in the back, yes. Um, ah, is it the, oh, is it the conference Wi-Fi? Oh, I'm on edge room, which explains why it worked for me. Um, okay. Uh, well, I guess then if you if you want to run your own local Jupyter server, hopefully um, that will completely bypass the bad conference center Wi-Fi. Um, does everybody know how to do that? Vaguely. Yes. No. Does anybody need help doing it? Sorry? Yeah. <laughs> I'm taking a long time to download some GR binaries, apparently. Ah. Uh. <laughs> what was the other package? 
Uh, HDF5. Uh, HDF5 is also not super essential because we're only going to use it at the end to do some I.O. So if you want to start installing it and then in another process, like while we wait an hour for it to install, um, do everything else, that's cool too. Um, Can I get another show of hands of people who are ready to go, if anyone is? A couple more. Um, like about half the room, I'd say. Uh, Beth, I know in my experience, HDF5 is the best operating system. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, well, ideally, we won't have to worry about it because we'll all be busy learning many things in the first four out of five parts. Um, so, yeah, don't stress out too much if HDF5 won't install for you. What's up? Do you need a specific version of the HDF5? Yeah, 0.6 is, is the one you want. Uh, so GR won't download it? Sorry? Uh, sorry, okay. Is, is GR not installing for you on 0.6? On 0.5, we're having that problem. Okay. Um, yeah, it should work on 0.6. It was l working last night. Um. <laughs> okay. Uh, well, I guess when people are ready, um, we're going to start with part one, which is the easing model. Um, is anybody else like totally lost or just waiting for things to start start up? Or are we mostly okay? Please don't be shy about saying that nothing is working. Are we using uh, no, so you can also just write all the code yourself. But um, in the Jupyter notebooks, I've got skeletons of things, um, which you can again type out yourself. Um, and there is actually also, if you look in the file, there's a little Julia script um, with sort of pre-solved uh, versions of everything called timeevolved.jl, uh, which you can use to cheat if you'd like. Um, but it doesn't come with the real-time explanations, necessarily. Um, so if you really hate Jupyter, you don't have to use it. But uh, my huge number of words, as you can see, explaining what the hell is going on, uh, do come with the Jupyter notebooks. Uh, Are you in Julia 0.6 right now? Yeah. If you do package.build iJulia, that should set up the new kernel for you. Uh, okay, so the first thing we're actually going to do is a spin model that is totally classical, so it's boring. Well, not boring necessarily, but simple. Um, just as an introduction to what the hell a spin model is, because I'm guessing many people not being physicists have no idea what that means. Um, and hopefully I can justify to you why we should care. Um, so again, if you're still waiting for things to load, there's a lot of words here, so you can just listen to the boring sound of my voice explaining what spins are while everything loads. Um, so we're going to start with this so-called so classical easing model, which is nearly 100 years old at this point. Um, so it's a very simple model of magnetism. Um, and the basic idea is that you have all these little constituents in, let's say, a crystal. Um, I'm just going to lift up this object, which is not really a crystal. But you can imagine that all the little constituent atoms in like a piece of metal or whatever have some small little magnetic moment. And those magnetic moments either do or don't add up to form something that you can observe yourself. So for instance, the Earth is made up of a huge amount of small atoms, um, all of which ha have some propensity to magnetize. And we know that the Earth has a magnetic field because mo there's a huge number of small constituent iron atoms inside the Earth um, that all have magnetic moments adding up together to generate this actually not very strong magnetic field that the Earth generates that we can sense with like compasses. And in a compass, you also have a huge number of very small constituent parts adding up together to form something that has non-zero magnetic field that can detect the Earth's magnetic field around you. Um, but most things in life aren't magnetic. And the reason is that the small constituents are pointing in all kinds of different directions. Um, so the, oh, they don't add up to do anything interesting. Um, and it's somewhat rare that that does happen. And so the easing model is a simple explanation of why things are or are not magnetic. Um, and 
in the classical case, uh, we're going to, I guess, start there, um, see how the things can interact to work together to form some big magnetic thing we could observe, and then go on to the more realistic case, which is the quantum version. Um, so for now, we're going to model each little constituent of like the Earth or whatever our object is as having two possible states. Um, it can be up or down or north or south if you want. Um, and we're going to see if all the norths add up with all the souths to form something that's large compared to the system, which would be a magnet. Um, so another example of this, uh, to use my analogy that I was kind of not that proud of, is imagine we're all, like everybody at JuliaCon is playing tug of war with a 747. If we're all pulling in different directions, we're not going to do anything. But if everybody at JuliaCon, like all 200 people, grab the rope and pull in one direction, then the 747 might actually start moving. Um, and this is like somehow analogous to how magnetism works in a real material, where you just kind of add up what every local person is doing. And if they're not working together, then of course you won't have anything interesting happen. Um, but if we can make them all work together, then all of a sudden so-called macroscopic phenomena can happen. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to look at one-dimensional so-called spin chains. So we say that the local little mini unit of magnetism is a spin um, for complicated reasons that aren't particularly important, where again, I've attached a fancy name, or not particularly fancy name, um, to something that's really not that exciting. Um, so we're going to say that we have, if we have some, some one-dimensional chain of these little magnetic guys, each one can be up, or in this case red, or down. Um, and so if they're all up, then the magnet is going to point north. If they're all down, then the magnet's going to point south. Um, so these are just different ways of writing down a specific situation in our object, where I list the specific, like, site one is up, site two is down. Um, and since there's only two states on each site, and we're using a computer, um, we can represent that as a string of zeros and ones, um, which is why this is like convenient as a model to look at on the computer. Um, this isn't the only possible model you can have in physics. You can have like minus one, zero, and one, but that's more of a pain to write down. You can have like zero to 20 as possible states, but we're going to focus on the simple, easy to understand situation where you have just zeros or ones, one corresponding to up and zero corresponding to down. Um, and we're going to write down a bunch of models that use these to simulate the magnet. Um, so what exactly is the easing model? The easing model tells you if I have one of these configurations, I can assign some energy to it. Uh, so essentially, like how likely is that configuration, or um, how, how favorable is it? And then we can find the most favorable configuration. Um, having done so, we can measure things about it that will tell us, like, is the most favorable configuration magnetic or not? Um, so how many people have I completely lost by this point? <laughs> Everyone? No one? <laughs> uh, We're good? Okay, cool. Um, if nobody says you're good, I'm going to assume I've lost everyone. So uh, speak up, or I'll just stand here awkwardly looking very upset. Um, <laughs> uh, so what we're going to do is we're going to write some Julia code to find all the possible configurations of the system, find the most favorable one, and then measure the magnetism of that configuration. Uh, so the function that lets us measure the energy, again, giving a fancy name to something that's not particularly complicated, is called the Hamiltonian. Um, and we always write it as this object H, uh, because Hamiltonian starts with H. Um, physicists are really good at naming things. Uh, <laughs> so what this, this thing right here is essentially a short form, if you want, like pseudocode recipe for writing down the function of how these will interact with each other. So what this is saying, is that for each little spin in the chain, um, for its nearest neighbors, so for the guy to the right and the left of it, um, see how those two sites interact with each other. So for instance, if we have a chain that's like length four, we're going to look at how site one talks to site two, but not site three, because site three is too far away. Um, and site one if, es essentially never hears about what site three is doing. Uh, and then this sigma here, the sigma i, is the local configuration, if you want, on that site. So that's just 0 for down or 1 for up, if we go back to look up here. Um, 
And so for now, since this is this classical model, we literally just multiply these two things together. So we say, like, are they aligned? So are they both zero, or are they both one? And that's all we got to do. Um, and that will be the function that tells us the energy. And whichever configuration has the lowest energy is the most favorable one. Um, and so for now, this is like extremely boring and silly, if you want, because there's no parameters in here, really. Like I, you, I, yeah. yeah. You could say the one with the lowest energy is the more interesting. But earlier, I thought it was having a lot of things that pointed in the same direction to add up to something relatively high compared to the environment was the thing. Aren't, aren't those opposite? Well, so the thing that that's, I guess, like somehow interesting about models like these is that in certain situations, sometimes the lowest energy one is the one where they all align to do something, so form like a magnetic state, and sometimes that's not favorable. Um, and we're going to do a bunch of simulations to find out when that is and is not the case. Um, so I guess the, the cheat version right now is that for this model, where we just ask, like, are they the same or not the same, the most favorable configuration is always going to be the one where they're aligned. Um, and then we're going to add some stuff later that will have that not be the case. Um, oh, that's the negative. Yeah, that's what the negative is for. So for example, if you have like, let's say we had all of these be ones. So then this would just be minus one times one and one times one. So then the Hamiltonian would be minus whatever number of sites you had for the entire system. Whereas if they were all anti-aligned, so if it was like one, zero, one, zero, one, zero, then the Hamiltonian would be zero. So that would be much less favorable. Um, Uh, this will be easier to answer once I show you the code and scroll down a little bit. But yeah, I'm kind of playing fast and loose between spins and sigmas right here. So the thing that's not one is minus one, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, that only really becomes super important when we actually want to measure the magnetization, which we'll do in a second. Um, so uh, is anybody completely lost right now? It's fine to say yes. OK, cool. Um, am I going too slowly? OK. <laughs> so, someone nodded yes. Thank you for whoever that was. <laughs> um, OK, so here, uh, for people who have never written this before, I have um, some code that does this. Uh, oh, actually, this is bad. I plus one. So I originally wrote this for a 2D system. So if you want, you can modify it. Um, but it's not super important since this is a classical. Uh, using model, so we can do it very easily. So the thing that's important right here is that the energy, um, which comes in, which is what the Hamiltonian is going to give us, the meat of what's going on here is we say for every single site, look at its next nearest neighbor or its nearest neighbor, which is site J, um, and then the energy is uh, minus one if they are um, aligned. Um, I've got sign errors here, all over here, I'm sorry. Um, so the energy is going to be 1 if they're anti-aligned. Uh, <laughs> sorry, it's a low copy did it. So, okay. I get confused about this a lot, apparently. Um, so if the configuration on site I is the same as the configuration on site J, so if they're both 1, then the energy is minus one, which is good. Um, and if the two are anti-aligned and the Zor is true, um, then the energy is going to be plus one, which is somehow worse from the perspective of minimizing it. Um, so this is going to select. Uh, Question? Yes. Is that faster than just doing the uh, Not in this situation, but it is going to be faster in a second when we generalize this to a more complicated model. Um, so often, when people actually like write these codes, the reason uh, this looks like Zor here is because when people write these codes for the more complicated model, this is what it'll look like. Um, so if you ever look at some like horrendous physics code uh, from, for instance, on my GitHub, you'll see like Zors all over the place uh, running around because we usually pulled it in from like some more complicated model. What's up? Oh. <laughs> uh, um, 
And then the other thing we, we might need to do is make like a list of, so for each element in the Hamiltonian, um, we're, we're going to make a matrix that describes like what is this object, uh, what, are, what is the energy of each configuration. And we're going to need a list to translate like the ith row in the Hamiltonian corresponds to this specific list of spins. Um, and the nice thing about the using the zeros and the ones is of course like you also represent integers as a list of zeros and ones, right? Um, so you can pretty easily translate between the zero and one representation and a number that describes like this row in our matrix um, is the energy of, of this specific spin. Um, so f oh, um, there's multiple ways to turn like an integer, if you want, into whatever the specific corresponding spin configuration is. Um, here I've shown a representative example from physics code, which looks kind of horrible if you're not used to screwing, to messing around with bits. Um, oh, sorry, there's a question. Oh, so the Hamiltonian is a matrix for each row represents a configuration. Yeah. In this case, the system itself is a 1D system, but when you move to a 2D system, do you also just roll it out? Yeah, yeah, exactly. So you don't make no, so, so the, the trick, um, I guess, of quantum mechanics is that, like I said, everything is just linear algebra. So any d-dimensional quantum system, the Hamiltonian is always a linear operator, so you can always write it down as a matrix. Um, and for something like this, which is, we say, like a two-level system, so each site can have two possible configurations, uh, the dimension of the Hamiltonian will always be 2 to the n, where n is the number of sites. Uh, but of course, n gets big really fast if you have like, let's say I want to do a six-dimensional uh, quantum mechanical problem, right? Um, I want to look, using like some matrix like this, I want to look at it two by two by two by two by two by two uh, six-dimensional object. Um, and I want to like simulate how, what the quantum mechanics of that is going to be. Um, so that's two, two, two to the six, um, which is, I think, like far bigger than any anything you could actually like store on a computer. Um, so normally for, for what we're going to do, uh, actually like explicitly writing out the Hamiltonian matrix, you can only ever solve systems in 1D or very small systems in 2D because you very quickly run out of room um, because the system will blow up extremely quickly in, in matrix size. Uh, does that make sense? Um, yeah, I, I understand why you ran out of room, but if you were just theoretically writing it down, yeah. Yeah. Well, so the Hamiltonian you can always write down as a 2D matrix because you can say like you you'll you'll turn your your 2D like tensor if you want of like of spins into some linear index. Oh, um, so you just end up unrolling. Yeah, you always just end up unrolling okay. it. Um, and then you just need to be careful about staying consistent about like this index corresponds to this spin state. Um, and there's all kinds of like funky orderings you can come up with to do this. Uh, there's like so-called reverse typewriter and typewriter and stuff like that. Um, but at the end of the day, yes, you unroll. Like imagine I have a 6D crystal that's like also some weird, like not square structure. Then you just carefully assign like the i bit corresponds to this site in my weird looking crystal. Um, Uh, yes, um, <laughs> ask me about how I wasted a month of cluster time with exactly this problem recently. Um, <laughs> so there's multiple ways to turn the integer into some sort of representation of zeros and ones. I have this horrific looking function right here, or we can just use the beautiful Julia function digits. Um, <laughs> so if I have the integer 20 and I want to turn it into a list of, a list of digits, um, or sorry, I want to turn it into a list of zeros and ones. Uh, I can just do this using digits. Um, and if we had like a five site system, this would just be like down, down, up, down, up. Um, so we're going to use whether the bit is zero or one on each site um, to kind of write down whether the state is up or down on that site. Then make a matrix using those integers to describe the energy of each state. Um, so maybe I'm like beating this horse to death, but this is going to be important later when we make things more general. Um, so if we do this, if we want to write down a, a 
uh, code to generate the basis. The nice thing is um, we can just say, like, we'll use all the integers between 0 and 2 to the L, which is the system size. But we should make sure, again, that those would be all unique, um, since you don't want to have, like, twice the same state in your basis because you've forgotten something if you've done that. Um, and having done so, we can go through now for the classical model and just literally build this matrix. Um, so for each integer, uh, you calculate the energy, and that is this Hamiltonian. Um, so this thing is purely diagonal, which is pretty nice. Um, and here, you can see that I've run um, an eigenfactorization on a diagonal matrix, which is kind of a stupid thing to do, because if it's diagonal, you already know the eigen energies. Um, uh, but once we add off-diagonal terms, which we'll do in a second, um, things are going to become more annoying. Yeah? So it looks like x, is x or nor the unit is really a 6? Yeah. Uh, so what did it used to be called something else? Called the, dollar uh, the dollar sign. Oh, just the dollar sign? Yeah, it was like a dollar sign b, I think. Uh, um, the, the, oh. the new equivalent of dollar sign, I believe, is the, the spectacular v bar. Um, which looks pretty cool, actually. I think it appears later on in this series. Um, okay. So we're, uh, sorry, yeah? I was just wondering if you could explain the digits function a little bit more. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so what we want to do is, is say, like, I have this integer, which is going to be also like my row index, and I want to find some way to, figure, to, to translate from that integer into this language up here. And so digits is going to let us do that by just looking at, like, specifically, if I wrote 20 in base 2, what would that be? And that would be the digits in this string. The second argument is the base. Yeah. Um, so uh, this function more explicitly goes through and is, like, for each site, figure out, like, is it 0 or 1, um, if that's more confusing. Uh, any other questions about this part? Yes. Yeah. Uh, and the reason I guess people do it this way is because then it's like somehow easy to index the matrix. Like for example, uh, there are other models where instead of having zero or one on each site, you can have numbers between zero between one and twenty. Um, so turning that into a like this is the this specific configuration of like it's one on site one, five on site two, four on site three. Uh, six on site five or whatever is really, really annoying to turn that into an integer, which is one reason that when we simulate quantum mechanical models, we usually pick something like this that only has two states because it's way less of a pain to write down the model in the first place. Can you use that to ease more easily expand to like a three half model or something like that? Um, Other than just like a spin one half model? So, well, sort of, yes. Um, I mean, yeah. Uh, Yeah, you could. Uh, the other thing you can do, actually, um, is you can use this explicitly if you're just a little bit careful about how groups add up. Like, you can split three halves, right, into, like, one half, cross one half. Um, people do that, too. Uh, it's kind of gross, and you have to be careful about how groups add. But you can do it. Um, especially if you're doing the three halves AKLT model. Uh, OK, any other questions about part one? Um, if you're totally mystified, please ask. <laughs> uh, otherwise, I, I'm going to assume that I've either lost everyone's interest or everyone is happy. And keep going. Keep going. Yeah. Okay, keep going. All right, so now, having done the simpler classical case, we're going to expand this and, if you want, quantify the easing model. Um, so what we want to do now is add in um, some off-diagonal terms uh, that are going to require us to, like, if you want, like actually solve an eigenproblem rather than just being like, I wrote down the diagonal matrix, done. Um, so we're going to add in now this, um, this transverse field term. Um, and now the sigmas that before you can see did not have any so-called hats have hats because now they are themselves linear operators. Um, so these sigmas, which I will write out in a second, um, Sigma x and sigma z are two by two matrices that act on whatever the local state is. And we're going to combine them to make a huge operator h, which is going to be a really big matrix. Um, so the action of sigma x 
um, on a one is to flip it to zero, um, and on a zero is to flip it to one. So it's literally just a bit flip matrix. Um, it looks like this guy uh, down here. Um, and sigma z is a measurement uh, on one or zero. So it's going to say if you're one, you're up, and if you're zero, you're down. Um, and we're going to combine these uh, across the entire system to make a, a Hamiltonian, which is going to be some big, gross-looking matrix that describes the interactions of the entire system, solve it, find the most likely configuration, which may not be intuitively obvious, uh, and then look for, for magnetism. Um, sound good? So I've got some examples here of the actual action of this matrix, sigma x, on various states. Um, you can see if you'd like. Uh, you can write your own here. Um, if you, if you want, and to see how the two sigma z's interact, we can just take their Kronecker product, um, and that gives us this four by four array, um, which would describe how this blob interacts on a bond in the spin chain. Um, sound good? Yes. How do you write the superscript? Oh, um, oh, okay, yeah, if you've never done, I was really excited when I figured out how to make this work. Um, <laughs> Which is why I did it like 40 times. Um, <laughs> so what you do is you do slash sigma, um, and then slash caret z. Yeah. Um, so this actually becomes a little tiresome. Uh, if you, well, you'll see in the next section, it got tiresome to write the next little bit. But it's fun um, <laughs> for the first like five times you do it. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> So looking at this, you might say, like, hold on, okay, so you told me this was like a little recipe to make the model, but actually, um, I know linear algebra, and this doesn't make any damn sense. Um, and the reason it doesn't necessarily make sense is you, you might look at this and say, hold on, you just told me that, that this thing is a two by two matrix, and this thing is four by four, so how am I adding a two by two and a four by four matrix? Like, what's going on? And you're telling me that at the end of the day, I get something that's two to the L by two to the L, something is wrong here. Um, and the reason is that this is, a short form recipe, and by short form I mean really short form. Uh, in a second we'll see why. So really what I've done here is I've elided a huge number of Kronecker products with the identity matrix. Um, so you should imagine here, uh, for on site I, this is two by two. Um, so this object is Kronecker with identity matrices on every single other site. Um, and this is Kronecker with identity matrices on every single site not involved in the bond, uh, so that at the end of the day, we'll get something that's two to the L by two to the L. So for example, if we had a four site chain, if I wrote it the Hamiltonian in full, this is what it would look like. Um, so as you can see, I, I had some fun putting superscripts on things, but it quickly got annoying, um, <laughs> which is why I only did four sites and not six like I had originally planned. Um, also, this fits on one line. So this term here expands out to something like this. Um, where we have the, the bond between 1 and 2, and then 2 and 3, 3 and 4, um, and then 1 and 4 if we had a periodic boundary condition. And then the transverse field comes in as uh, the transverse field on 1, 2, 3, and 4. So this is long and kind of horrific looking. Um, if you're looking at this and being like, I actually have less intuition than when I started, uh, that's why we write it like this, because th this object is actually somewhat easier to turn into code, I think. Although that might just be like years of accumulated <laughs> physics brain damage. Um, <laughs> Can you explain what you mean by the transverse direction? Yeah, so, so you can see here that this has a superscript Z. Um, it might be a little hard to see if the screen is too small. Uh, yeah, I can absolutely zoom in. Better? Oh my god. <laughs> Not that, apparently. <laughs> uh, oh, there it is. Better? Oh, incredible. <laughs> Woo, better? Um, okay, so you can see here that this sigma has a Z on it, and this one has an X, and that's telling you like somehow what direction they're pointing in. So this is saying that this is like the Z magnetic field, and this is the X magnetic field. So this is where the, the quantum part comes in, because um, if you have a bunch of quantum mechanical spins that are pointing in the Z direction, 
that's not necessarily like if you make a measurement of their direction uh, of their x magnetic moment, which normally you would say if you have a 3D system, um, that should be zero because x and z are orthogonal. Well, quantum mechanically, that's not true anymore. Uh, in fact, if you have something that's purely so-called du purely up, and you measure its uh, magnetic moment in the x direction, it'll actually be positive half the time, um, and negative half the time. Um, and you can check that if you want by like looking at whatever this matrix is. Where did I write this? Oh, oh here it is. So if you look at sigma um, x here, uh, we're writing everything in, in the situation where we're looking at spins that are up in z or down in z. Uh, but this matrix sig sigma x is not diagonal, um, as you can see. It's exactly, it's perfectly non-diagonal. So it somehow mixes the two. Uh, and that's why we call it transverse, because it's transverse to z and it's going to also kind of destroy the tendency of the system to align, um, depending on how strong the transverse field is. Uh, does that answer the question? Um, okay. So if you, uh, um, well, the reason is because x times z is y, but to also it's because this is so this this matrix you can also see is purely real, which is helpful um, because everyone hates complex numbers, uh, but also um, because uh, to see interesting physics you only need it to be in one direction. And finally, uh, it may not stay only in X and Z for long. Um, <laughs> yeah. So, um, before there were only there were two possible states for, for study. Yeah. And now there's how many possible states? There's still two, but now we can mix them. Um, or you can, you can flip between them. It can be in both at once. Well, OK. Yeah. Um, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't say it can be both at once. stuck with zero or one. And yeah. Yeah, you're stuck with you're stuck with zero and one, but now you have off-diagonal operators that can that can move you between them, which was not possible in the previous model, and that's where all the quantum mechanical stuff is going to come from, just by the fact that you now have off-diagonal operators in the Hamiltonian. Does that make sense? Um, yeah, but each each state is like defined by having the they have the sigma x and sigma z matrix associated with each state, right? No, they have they have a um, they have a local Z configuration, we would say. So you can be up in Z or down in Z, and then, oh, okay. so yeah. So the, the state of the system is just defined by the, by the Z. Yeah. Maybe. Yeah. Oh. Um, so for instance, like if we want to measure the overall magnetization, we'll just measure the sigma Z on every single site. Okay. Um, and then the sigma X can screw things up for us by flipping between the two. Uh, so if we got rid of this a, if we set h equal to zero, we're back where we were before. Um, only if it's non-zero does anything interesting happen. Uh, and in this formula, where I've written like these things, um, I've kind of I also got tired of writing O times like 40 times. Um, so these are all Kronecker products, and these will end up being um, two to the four matrices. So I actually wrote out what this looks like. Um, it's really gross. I don't recommend doing this yourself. But you can see at the, that at the end of the day, we do get a matrix that's 16 by 16. Um, with a bunch of off-diagonal terms in it. So if you did the eigenfactorization of this, which is relatively easy because the 16 by 16 matrix is not particularly big, um, you'll get whatever the ground state is, uh, and that will be the most likely configuration, and we can make measurements on it. Um, and our choice here of, of being spin up or spin down for, for false or for true is totally arbitrary. Um, so it doesn't really matter uh, which one you pick. Um, so we can now have our function to like switch um, between the bit and integer representation. You can use digits for this. Um, I pulled this out again just to show people the kind of hor horrific situation I deal with every day in my advisor's code um, <laughs> or my code. Sorry, Bailey, if you're listening to this. Um, so we need, we need to do two things. We need to generate the list of configurations, and then we need to write a model or write a function to turn this into this. Um, so one way you could do this is to write all the Kronecker products out. I don't recommend doing that because it's horrible. Uh, but you could do it that way. Uh, another option is to use the little, the little recipe here to actually fill in the matrix elements, which is what I've done in this example. So we have this function, transverse field easing, which generates a basis. Um, and for now, it takes a dense matrix H. Um, 
figures out which sites are connected to which, which is what Bonds here does, um, goes through, fills in the diagonal elements, um, and then fills in the off-diagonal elements as, uh, as the second part. So this part is the part that's new and probably the part that is going to be confusing. So this just says for every single site in the chain, um, flip the spin, here's VBAR, the new ZOR, uh, flip whatever the spin is on that site, sorry, um, find out what new, what this new s configuration we've generated corresponds to in the basis, and then finally add in the matrix element. Um, and then at the end of the day, we return the Hamiltonian we've generated in the basis. Uh, the nice thing is that, that the Hamiltonian is always Hermitian, um, so that's cool. In fact, since our matrix is real, it's symmetric, so that's also pretty cool. Um, and uh, once we have this matrix, we can then compute things with it. Sound good? Have I lost everyone again? Why did you use Hermitian and not symmetric? Because oh, because generically, you could have complex numbers in here. Um, the off so the diagonal term is, is almost always real, but the off-diagonal term may have complex, like complex phases or something. Um, and it's, it's normally more generic to have it be Hermitian. Uh, and actually, Julia will internally be like, a real Hermitian matrix is always symmetric, so uh, it'll deal with the fact that I'm lazy, um, <laughs> which is nice. Um, so one thing you might also note about this is that this matrix is really, really sparse. Um, and for most solvable quantum models, that's the case. So again, I was lazy um, and made this a dense matrix. But in the future, for bigger systems, you'll probably want to make the Hamiltonian explicitly sparse. Um, and for now, we also set the transverse field to be the same everywhere. Uh, there was nothing forcing us to do this other than things being simple. Um, so if you wanted, and this will be like a further thing someone can do, you can make the transverse field in every site be different and have a disordered system. Um, and there's a bunch of interesting physics that will come out from doing that. Uh, but for now, um, we can just be lazy, make our transverse field easing Hamiltonian with like L equals eight and a transverse field of one and do the eigenfactorization on it. Um, and it works. Uh, people still good? Uh, the one, ah, it's 11.46, perfect. So that, so if we compute the eigenfactorization um, for a small system like this, that gives you all of what are the so-called eigenstates. So the eigenstates are, um, the lowest energy one is called the ground state, and the ground state at zero temperature is the system, is the configuration that you would actually find the system in. It may be a linear combination of these zero and one states that we wrote down. In fact, for non-zero transverse field, it will be. Um, and the ground state somehow is like, uh, if, if it favors all the spins being aligned, um, then at zero temperature, the whole system will be magnetic. Um, and then the states above that are called the excited states, and that's uh, where you'll see, like, for instance, um, what's the best way to describe this? Like, if you, if you bump the system and you can see, like, propagating magnetic defects in it, those are the excited states that are corresponding to the eigenvectors with out the smallest corresponding eigenvalue um, to translate this into linear algebra language, which is like uncomfortable. Um, <laughs> okay, everyone still doing okay? Um, so uh, you might also remember that I promised you some parallelism in this workshop. Um, it's coming, although we don't need it quite yet. Uh, so for now also, um, I guess this is reproducing the horrible situation when you develop a research code where you read it on a single node first um, and it doesn't work very well and you fix it a bunch of times uh, and then come back um, and parallelize it later. Uh, so the thing that is nice about this though is that we don't actually need a huge cluster to do some interesting many body physics. If this were 1996, that would not be the case. Um, but luckily, since we live in 2017, you can actually solve an L equals eight quantum spin chain on your laptop. Um, that was not the case for a long time. Uh, so what we're gonna do is vary this transverse field, actually do some physics and measure the magnetization, um, since I told you we were looking at magnets. Um, oh, I lost my example here. Uh, so if the sum of the local moments is zero, then there's no overall magnetization, and the system is boring like most things in the world are. If the sum is non-zero, um, or if the sum is close to one, then the system is probably magnetized, uh, and that's interesting. Um, 
So here, I also have written a little function magnetization to calculate this. Um, and all it does is go through the basis that we generated, um, given some, some state that, like, for instance, could be an eigenvector of the Hamiltonian, um, and then computes uh, the per site magnetization, which is this element m, sums them all up, and returns the total magnetization. Uh, does that make sense? Yes, no? Does not make sense to Okay. Uh, so finally, the last thing we're going to do um, is pick a variety of transverse fields to look at. For each transverse field, make a Hamiltonian corresponding to it, find the lowest energy eigenvector, measure its magnetization, and plot, or uh, depending on how well this plotting works, um, just compute what is the magnetization for that transverse field at this system size. So that's what this little blob is doing here. Um, and I promise in a second, you guys will be writing your own horrible physics code rather than just listening to me talk about bad code I wrote. Uh, so here we go through a bunch of different system sizes L and a bunch of transverse fields. Um, if you want to run this uh, on your laptop, go for it. If you're not plugged in, though, it might eat your battery a little bit, just FYI. Um, <laughs> so you can watch me do it, because I'm plugged in. Um, so for each of these uh, transverse field, oh. For each transverse field um, between minus 10 to the minus 2 and 10 to the 2, um, we're going to make the Hamiltonian, find the ground state, uh, and then print out what it is. Uh, so you can see for a very small transverse field, the magnetization is really big. It's like almost 1, um, which makes sense because the tendency of the system is for the spins next to each other to want to align. And then as you turn up the transverse field, so go right in these lists, um, you can see that the magnetization gets much, much weaker because the transverse field is breaking the ability of the local, um, the local bonds to like coerce each other and all pointing the same direction. Um, and so the thing that kind of sucks about this is because uh, you guys probably don't want to sit here for two weeks watching this IPython notebook run. I can't go to a bigger system size where you can see this, this change become much sharper. Um, but for, for a bigger system like L equals 20, you'll see that at, at H equals 1, when the transverse field is 1, you effectively have the, the magnetization drop from 1 to 0 as the system completely demagnetizes and goes through a phase transition. Um, so again, if you wanted on your own time to run this for bigger L, go ahead. Um, but since you probably don't want to watch like one of these come in an hour, uh, you'll have to take it on faith that there is actually a phase transition um, at, that becomes sharper and sharper as L gets bigger and bigger. Um, and the reason that happens is that small systems like this are vulnerable to what we call finite size effects, um, where the, the interesting quantum mechanical features become more and more pronounced at larger system size. Um, so uh, for now, uh, hopefully it's like a little bit cool, I guess, to see the magnetization drop as you turn on the transverse field. Hopefully that's interesting to people besides me. Do you have the state of a bigger uh, Not on me, um, but <coughs> part, actually the other reason I don't have it for really big systems is because to see it happen in a very dramatic way, you need to do quantum Monte Carlo. Um, so if we have time at the end, I can show you a video uh, of tuning from the paramagnetic, which is the non-magnetic phase, to the ferromagnetic phase, which looks pretty sweet because you can see um, the, basically you can see the coercion happen. Um, so if you have time afterwards and you want to do something like measure the magnetic susceptibility, which shows how vulnerable the system is to listening to the transverse field, go ahead. But um, since it's, we're almost halfway through, I think we should go on to the next bit of um, writing our own code to do this. Uh, so does anybody have any more questions about this part? Now that you've listened to me lecture about this for an hour. No, the parallelism is coming. Um, the parallelism we're going to need for the next part after uh, we write our own types and other fun things. <laughs> um, so if we want to go on to part three, this um, type coding, type, types and, and parallelism bit, um, we're going to use some of Julia's type system to write down a bunch of very similar Hamiltonians, which are more complex, um, using two senses of that word. 
um, and also have more interesting physics. Um, and so there's going to be a bunch of code in this that's like not very good, probably, because uh, I wrote it. So if you see something and you would like to improve it because uh, you're bored by me talking, go ahead. Um, but hopefully it's somewhat clear for non-physicists like what's going on. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to write a bunch of matrix constructor functions like we did for the transverse field easing model for a variety of different Hamiltonians. Um, we're going to extend some methods in base uh, to make things easier on ourselves. And then we're going to look at a bunch of different physics models. Um, so here, I promise I'll finally stop showing you bad code that I wrote very soon. We have this abstract type, abstract Hamiltonian, um, which takes some data type that's like complex or real uh, and a matrix. Uh, so we can have our Hamiltonian matrix be sparse or dense. Um, and then as an example, uh, so Hamiltonians are always Hermitian. So for, we can immediately extend the base method for that and not worry about it. Um, I've redone the transverse field easing part from the previous bit um, as its own type. So the model has some spin chain length L some basis, um, some matrix that cor that's of this abstract matrix type S, um, which could be sparse or diagonal or whatever we want, and the corresponding transverse field. Um, and here uh, we've got this function I wrote for the previous bit for constructing the dense matrix um, now as a constructor for this uh, type. And if you'd like, uh, as you can see, I did not, in the notebook, write this function. You can rewrite this transverse field easing constructor for the dense matrix for a sparse type. Um, so if folks want to go ahead and, and do that, um, we can all start typing. Um, and the code is going to look very similar. Uh, you just need to find some convenient way to make the Hamiltonian sparse, basically. Um, so go forth uh, and write sparse matrix contractors. Um, yeah? Sorry, real quick, just Julia question. Yes. The Yeah. Yeah. Um, so this is this new type syntax um, where this transverse field easing function is parameterized on these types. So TV um, can be essentially like any type, although really it's going to be like a, either a float or complex. So it's saying um, essentially what this is doing, and I hope somebody who who I hope there's nobody who's really familiar with internals because then they won't be able to beat me up for getting this wrong. Um, <laughs> So what this is saying is essentially like parameterize this function on all possible types TV and all possible types S, um, specifically in the case where S is a sort of matrix. So for instance, where S would be a dense diagonal or a dense symmetric or whatever. And then down here, you can write your own version, own specialization where S is a type of sparse matrix. And you could also imagine, for instance, uh, let's say you didn't want to write out the Hamiltonian explicitly at all. You just wanted to have it as some like implicit function that tells you how the matrix would multiply the vector, you could do that too as your, your own thing. Cool. What are those things that are called matrices or something like that? Actually, this should also be a CSC. Um, no, sparse matrix is not a subtype of matrix, because matrix is explicitly dense. For, the, for this top function, you mean? Yeah. Yeah, so. Yeah. I mean, I guess you could use like a strided matrix in a different function. I don't know why you would do that. Yeah. yeah. Sorry, I think I'm confused about what you were asking. Yeah. Oh, okay. Well, uh, you can just put I don't. I don't think I will because I ran this yesterday and it worked. So. Uh -huh. uh, we'll convert back. Oh, okay, cool. Well, that's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> you just wrap the math definition and emission. Yeah. Cool. Well, now I learned something about internals that I didn't know. Um, David, you look upset again. Okay. <laughs> Um, are people doing okay writing their own sparse matrix version of this? I don't know how to do it. 
Oh, OK. Um, so basically, uh, if, if you are confused, you can either look in this time evolved JL function, or uh, I can show you what I did, which was pretty simple. Um, you can, since the only thing we actually need to change here uh, is like the Hamiltonian itself, not the function to figure out what the elements are, we can say that uh, we're going to instead like make a list of the indices. So hi's is just um, hj's, since we can store the sparse matrices as like a list of ij value pairs, um, and then get rid of this since we don't want to make this dense. Um, and here again, we have some term where we were making like the diagonal element of h this aptly named diag term. So instead, we can just push to the i indices um, the index. Whoa, what happened there? We can put this needs a bang. We can push to the j indices again the index and to the values hvs um, this diag term. And then similarly, you would do the same thing for the off-diagonal part, although in this case, it's not diagonal, obviously. And at the end of the day, um, sparse H is simply a sp Julia sparse matrix um, made of HIs, HJs, and H values. Um, sound good? Sorry. <laughs> People okay so far still? Yes. Is, is there a reason it is better to do the uh, <coughs> construct the sparse array by indexing rather than construct the sparse array and then assign elements into it? Um, I think that it's slightly faster to do it, like to construct the i's and the j's initially. Um, the, it's a lot faster. OK. Um, there's actually probably an even faster way to do this, because you, as you can see, I just made this some like dumb, empty array, right? Uh, if you were more familiar with the models, you would be able to say, like, I know exactly how many elements per row there are going to be. So you could pre-allocate this and then fill it in and like keep a counter if I'm on the ith element or something. Um, but I think, yeah, generically, it is much faster to construct to build the list of indices and values first and then feed them in this, into the sparse constructor. Um, rather than going index by index, because then effectively you're constructing these like every time you insert something, right? Um, I think. I can explain it for you a little bit later. Uh, yeah, the, t the TLDR is if you go into base slash sparse slash sparse matrix .il, you're in for a wild ride. Um, <laughs> oh, something's happening. Okay. Have I managed to confuse everybody again? Are we good? Fallen. OK. Um, so uh, again, if you want, you can pre-allocate the arrays for the sparse matrix. Um, since if you do a little back of the envelope arithmetic, you can figure out exactly how many elements per row there can be. Um, another option, uh, which you would actually end up doing for a bigger system, is that uh, generating the basis can be pretty slow. Um, so another option is to fill it in as we go, because for each row, as you say, like s this configuration can move to this one. If you've never seen this new configuration before, you can insert it into the basis um, and continue rather than having to generate the entire basis at the outset. Um, so this is also like often faster. Uh, and another thing we could do as an exercise, um, me being me, is uh, write a bunch of tests to make sure our matrix is Hermitian um, and to make sure that it matches the previous function. And for instance, you can try generating like the sparse version for a really small system that you can generate the dense one for, dense one for and make sure that, for instance, the energies slash eigenvalues should all match for your two representations. Um, if they don't, something horrible has happened. Um, and we can also just make life a little more convenient for ourselves by extending some of the base methods, which is why it's sometimes worth it to write the type, because we can just call eigenfactorization blindly on this idiot Hamiltonian. Um, and it'll just run the thing. Um, we can say that, like, for instance, the size of the Hamiltonian is the size of its matrix. It's always two-dimensional. Um, whether or not it's sparse is determined by whether uh, its constituent matrix is sparse. There's probably some fun way to do this with like the type parameterization, but I was lazy and didn't do it. Um, so now we can move on, if we want, to the more crazy physics stuff. So the transfer field easing model is cool. But, and you can like see the 
transition between magnetic and non-magnetic states happen, but it's not particularly physically realistic. Um, I think there's like somebody who's an experimentalist can tell me, um, but there's probably like three or four real crystals that have an easing interaction. Um, it's actually pretty rare in like somehow real life to encounter a material that obeys the easing model. Um, you can engineer them with lasers and with ultra cold atoms, which is like awesome, but not super physical necessarily in the same way. Um, so what we want to do is now look at models that more, more accurately correspond to reality. Um, and in particular, we're going to look at three, uh, the XY, XXZ, and Heisenberg models. Um, so these are all actually basically variants on the same theme, which I will start off with talking about the Heisenberg model since the others we can get from it. Um, so these guys give us a somehow richer phase diagram um, and they're more interesting. Um, so for whoever it was who asked about transverse fields, um, here we've got our Heisenberg model, um, part of which will look familiar. It's saying for each site pair, so for each nearest set of nearest neighbors, um, we want to compute the dot product of their spins. So this term we remember these sigma z's, um, and then we've got the uh, the sigma x's and sigma y's here. So x dot x and y dot y um, are basically testing like are the two spins on the bond flippable? Um, so are they anti-aligned? And if they are anti-aligned, so if one is up and one is down, flip them both. Um, and this, so this is an off-diagonal operator right here. Uh, and this will become more clear in a second maybe when I actually read out what these matrices look like. Uh, but these are essentially saying um, if the spins are anti-aligned, do something. So if you have 0 and 1, turn that to 1 and 0. If you have 1 and 0, turn that into 0 and 1. If you have 0, 0, do nothing. If you have 1, 1, do nothing. Um, and again, uh, We'll see in a second the linear algebra version of this. But this is going to be a little recipe that let, lets us write out the code for, um, for these guys. Um, and the thing that's cool about this, like why, who cares about this at all? Um, in, in the easing model, we said that the magnetic moments wanted to align along the z direction. And this one gives us more freedom because now they can essentially pick whatever direction they want. Um, as long as they're all aligned, um, they can be like half, well, Okay, this is going to be a little, they can be like in the z direction or the y direction. The overall magnetic moment can actually be rotating around and have non-zero velocity as long as everybody stays aligned, which is kind of crazy, um, but uh, also, I guess, somehow interesting. Um, and the reason for this, if anybody really wants to know the minutia, is because the Heisenberg model has SU2 rotation symmetry, um, whereas the Ising model only has Z2 spin flip. And SU2 is a continuous symmetry, and Z2 is discrete. Um, so for like the one person here who cares about this, uh, <laughs> Andy, um, <laughs> uh, that's why uh, this guy is somehow like more interesting to us, I guess, because it supports a continuous symmetry. So the XXZ model is the same thing, except we introduce a little coupling constant delta in front of the Zs, and we can make the Z coupling weaker or stronger. Um, and the XY model is simply when delta is zero, so our familiar sigma Z, sigma Z term is gone. Um, so the XY model is interesting because it supports an, a very, I guess, interesting phase transition, the kosterlis thulis transition, which recently won a Nobel Prize. So if you can simulate this, you're basically halfway to getting a Nobel yourself, or one third of the way. Um. <laughs> okay, uh, so what we're gonna do is write our own types with constructors like we did for the transverse field easing model in the previous part. Um, after uh, we develop specifically what the heck these guys are doing. Um, so if you're confused about what to do writing these types, you can either refer back to the transverse field easing part or um, sneak peek at time of all at that JL, uh, which will show you what I ended up doing. Um, so let's go back and look at these sigma matrices. So we have sigma x, sigma x, which was familiar to us from the previous bit. And then sigma y, um, which is complex uh, and kind of gross. Um, so you can see that it's structured, again, similarly to sigma x, and that it's purely off diagonal. And it's minus i in the top right um, and plus i on the bottom left. Um, and then here again, we have sigma z. Um, so we can just take the Kronecker products of these guys together. So sigma x Kronecker with it itself is this weird looking horrible off diagonal guy. Um, similarly, sigma y Kronecker with itself uh, is now, I mean, it, 
because of type stability, this thing is complex, but really it's a matrix of real numbers. Um, so we've got minus one, 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 and minus one on the anti-diagonal, is that a word? I'm making it a word. Um, so we're going to combine these, these operators on all the bonds to make this big Heisenberg model or XXZ model or whatever. Um, and then we're going to tune delta like we tuned H in the transfer leasing model and hopefully see something cool happen. Um, but if you don't want to like write out the action specifically of, of these two things, we can actually cheat and use a little bit of quantum mechanics uh, and introduce two new matrices, the so-called ladder operators, sigma plus and sigma minus. Um, where we define sigma plus as uh, this thing. Um, and you can see here that what this does uh, is it acts like sort of half of the sigma x. It takes down to up and up to nothing. Um, and we can introduce sigma minus, which takes uh, similarly, if you wanted to compute this, it would take up to down and down to nothing. Um, so these are also called the raising and lowering operators. Um, does someone want to close the door? Sorry. It's like very loud out there. Um, so we can rewrite using a bunch of annoying algebra our Hamiltonian up here with these guys in terms of these new operators. Um, and what you'll get at the end of the day, you can verify this yourself if you like doing a lot of te tedious algebra, or you can believe me. Um, this is a famous uh, s sophomore quantum mechanics exercise for anybody uh, who remembers the dark old days of sophomore quantum mechanics. Um, we can rewrite our XXZ model as four times sigma plus sigma minus plus four times sigma minus sigma plus plus the delta times this guy. Um, so this object, if you're confused about what it does, um, just takes uh, anti-aligned, so zero, one, to 1, 0 on a bond, or 1, 0 to 0, 1. And it's called f flipper, I guess, um, among people who deal with this, this blob uh, commonly. And the reason we did it this way is it's easier to implement using this, like, these bit operations. Um, and it obscures the like, essential, if you want, symmetry of this problem. But it's easier for people who are coding. So this recipe is somehow simpler. Um, so now we can take this thing and write a function to do the XXZ model. Um, so we're going to write some constructors for XXZ, XY, and the Heisenberg models. Uh, and since these guys are all related, you can probably reuse a bunch of your code. Um, and uh, in particular, what might be the fastest thing to do would be to write some sort of function that implements these two together sigma z, sigma z, which you already have code for from the previous bit. And then given an input, conf some sort of input configuration in the basis generates the possible new configurations for that input uh, list of spins. Does that make sense? Have I lost everyone? People who are confused? Yes, no. Um, so essentially what we want to do is go back um, to what we did with the transverse field easing model up here. Um, and do something very similar for this new recipe, which is, has some pieces that are familiar, some pieces that are unfamiliar, um, and make the matrix for it. Uh, yeah. um, also, if it's like complicated or uh, annoying, it might help to work with somebody next to you um, and combine efforts. Um, so here, for example, is my shell of uh, the XXZ model. Um, do I have CSC on the end here? This one. Um, so we, just like for the transfer field easing model, the real difference between the sparse and dense versions is going to be how we insert elements into the Hamiltonian. Um, but you can reuse the function to like figure out where does this input configuration go to under the action of the flipping. Um, Sound good? Yes, no, maybe not. Um, and if you're super confused and have no idea where to get started, that's fine. Uh, I'm happy to help people. Um,
Actually, I lied. Uh, if you need help, you're going to have to wait like 20 seconds because I'm going to go grab more water, um, if that's OK. This is going to work if I go out and get water. So has everybody managed to mostly get started? Sorry. Uh. Silence applies no. <laughs> Will no one answer me? <laughs> uh, has anybody's friend managed to not get started at all? Um, <laughs> you're, you're confused again? Thank you for, for, for taking one for the team. Um, everyone salute this man, because he's a hero. Um, OK. So what we did before, right, was, was write a function, transitional easing, which turns this recipe into a matrix. So that is essentially our goal here. Um, and uh, let's see if I can wing this without looking at my previous code. Um, so if we're going to do this for the dense matrix, which is the easiest case because we don't have to insert anything into anything, um, we're going to want to turn this into a list for each input spin of possible spins it can move to and how likely that is to happen, right? Sound good? Um, so like I said, we already actually know how to do sigma z, sigma z, because we already have code for it. So that's awesome. Go team. Um, so I will just steal my code from before and then change it up a little bit um, for this xxz model. Uh, OK, so we're going to generate the basis. The basis is going to be the same. The list of possible configurations is cool. Um, the diagonal part is, again, easy because it's the same thing we did before. Um, although now, uh, instead of just having like plus minus 1 here, we're going to have some, this factor delta times the ZOR. Um, and then the off diagonal part is going to be different. Um, so we can just get rid of all of this stuff. Uh, and so we want to go for each, for each site um, in the system. It's next nearest, or its nearest neighbor. So n, n if we want. It's just going to be the site plus 1, which is why we also go from 1 to l minus 1, because otherwise you'd go off the end of the chain. Um, this is not what you want to do. And then this part is going to be us handling uh, this term up here, 4 sigma plus sigma minus plus 4 sigma minus sigma plus. So this is this flipping operation. Um, so I guess I'll write some comments here if you want. Uh, do the flipping, um, which takes 0, 1, 2, 1, 0, uh, or takes 1, 0, um, 0, 1. And if you have 0, 0, does nothing, nothing has no ER in it, or 1, 1. Why did that not go all the way? OK. Um, so uh, we can say that if we want like the bit on site i, or uh, yeah, let's say, bit on site i is just, um, is the element on that site. Um, the bit on site j 
is the element on that uh, on the nearest neighbor of that site. Um, just to go back, to, I guess, to this IJ language that our recipe is written in. Um, okay, uh, so we only do something if the two are anti-aligned, right? Which we can detect with Zor. So if our friend Zor, if the two spins bit i and bit j are not aligned, um, we'll do something. And if they are aligned, we'll do, we'll do something else, which is actually nothing. Um, so, so if these two are aligned, OK, we got to do something. And we got to figure out what exactly the new thing we've moved to is. Um, so we'll say that the new configuration is a copy of our current one, just so we don't mess up our current guy. Um, and then if we're going, if it's going to flip both spins, we actually do need to flip both of them. So we say that the new configurations um, spin on the site is going to get flipped, which we can do with vbar. <laughs> um, so this operation right here just flips the configuration on site um, on this specific site. Uh, and then similarly for the nearest neighbor, um, the thing gets flipped. So if you want to, you can actually like see what this looks like. You can like print um, the element and uh, the new configuration. I'm just going to put a space in here, because otherwise there won't be a space. Um, and you can see that we'll have flipped two spins, um, but only in the case where they're anti-aligned. Um, so then having generated what the new configuration is going to look like, we got to figure out what index does that correspond to. So you could do that by just converting all of its bits um, back into an integer, or we can uh, use find first again if we're lazy. So we can find this new configuration in the basis. Um, and that'll be the new index of, um, of the thing we move to when we apply the bit flipping operator. So finally, at the end of the day, uh, there is a possibility to move to this state indexed by new index from our current one, um, which is index. So h index new index uh, as the column is going to be equal to minus 4. Um, because that was the value we had up here in our recipe from a bunch of annoying uh, tedious linear algebra. And if the two spins are anti-aligned, it's just not possible to make a move off diagonally. So get rid of that. We're done. Um, does that make sense? Somewhat? A little bit? No, it's not OK, because uh, if I've completely <laughs> lost you, then you're not going to get anything out of uh, doing this for the Heisenberg model next, which is your next task. So um. <laughs> that's fine. Or any, 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 any number of sentences. <laughs> I'm going to go home and, and read through this notebook and then send it. OK. Um. <laughs> Uh, is anybody else completely confused? I don't know what that face means. <laughs> um, is anybody else following perfectly? Um, no. Other people are not following uh, People are perhaps in the spectrum of somewhat being confused and somewhat following? Yes. OK, cool. Um, <laughs> Sorry? Yeah, yeah, you absolutely could. I mean, um, so one way actually to, to go back to Eric's question about like why not just insert them is you could generically do that. I also have a version of this code that I used for work um, that that does something similar where you, it has its own like weird looking get index. Um, it's just more complicated and horrible. Uh, I can show you this code if you'd like. You'll be very unhappy if you see it. So. Yeah. Yeah, but then of course you run into the problem where maybe you wanted to use an external library with its own sparse matrix format, um, and then that happened like three or four times, um, and then it's it's not very nice looking code. Uh, it's not very nice looking code, um, but in principle, yes, you could do this. Uh, yeah, it's it's uh, it's bad. <laughs> Um, I think I did this correctly, though. 
Uh, so if we use the little recipe to build up this matrix for the XIC model, to turn it into the Heisenberg model is really simple, actually, because all you have to do is get rid of the delta. Um, it's actually quite simple. And in fact, the Heisenberg model is just the XXZ model with delta set to 1. And the XY model is just the XXZ model with delta set to 0, um, since delta controls the strength of the ZZ interaction. Um, so really, we only had to write one function. Um, I kind of lied to you when I said you had to write 3. Uh, <laughs> And you can extend this in various ways if you wanted to. For instance, there's a version of this where instead of just nearest neighbors, um, you then deal with next nearest neighbors. So like site 1 would deal with site 3, and it could flip spins on site 1 and site th 3. Um, and that's both more complicated to write and like takes forever to diagonalize. So that's why I didn't do it. Um, and also, I guess that model is like somehow not solved. Uh, so nobody. It's not that nobody knows, but it's unclear what the answer should be. So it's a little harder to test like whether or not your code works. Um, <laughs> but the nice thing about these models in 1D is that ostensibly we know what the answer has to be from, from various like theoretical pen and paper calculations. Um, so you can often, if you wanted to, like go look up 1D Heisenberg spin chain like magnetization for this parameter or something, and it'll tell you, oh, it has to be this. Um, and then if you're me, you're like, wow, my answer is completely wrong. Uh, cool. Um, I must have made a mistake somewhere, possibly by winging this constructor in front of everyone. Um, but if you have something like this working for the dense matrix, you can do something analogous to what we did for the easing model to convert it to the sparse matrix um, and keep rolling. Um, can I ask a question? Yes. If you want, yeah, so if you wanted periodic boundary conditions, so for people who, who don't know what that means, um, right now we're doing like a spin chain where um, I have one guy at the end here and one guy at the other end of my chain here and they don't talk to each other. Um, periodic boundary conditions is just gluing them together so instead I have a ring. Um, and all we would have to do since we're in 1D to do that, where did my for loop go, um, is instead of having going from sites one to the boundary minus one, just at the boundary, I would say connect your nearest neighbors, now the first site again. Um, and that would glue them together to be the ring. In, in two or more dimensions, this is more complicated. Um, and it becomes more and more complicated depending on the lattice you have. So for instance, for, for a square lattice, hopefully, I think we can all figure out, like, if I had a two-dimensional square lattice, well, I would just stitch together, like, the guys on the far right column join with the guys on the far left. And the guys on the bottom talk to their corresponding members up top. Um, but to use an example from my own life, uh, if you have a honeycomb lattice, there's multiple ways to glue together everybody on the edge. Um, and you will change the physics if you glue them together in the wrong way. Um, and it's very hard to get right. Uh, <laughs> again, ask me about wasting a month um, <laughs> doing that. Uh, and in 3D, of course, it's even more complicated. Um, because now you have multiple ways to connect everybody. Uh, and it's also like harder to draw to figure out if you did it correctly. Um, so that's one reason we did this in 1D also. It's much easier to, to mentally reason about what's going on. Um, so if, yeah, if you wanted to, for instance, you could change this to be periodic and a ring instead of a chain. Um, the other reason, I guess, that one does open boundary conditions is it's uh, the like effective system size is bigger. Um, because if you have periodic, the furthest anything can really be from anything else is actually half the system size since everybody's connected. But in open boundary conditions, uh, the furthest distance you can look at is the total system size minus one. Um, the downside is that uh, the open boundary condition system is more vulnerable to, like, to getting the wrong answer because your system is like, a little bit too small. Um, so okay. are people doing OK following along with making their Guy sparse or dense? I don't know what that face means. <laughs> Have I managed to utterly confuse everyone again? <laughs> Is that a yes, Eric? I'm too far with one. <laughs> <laughs> okay. How are we doing on time? Um, OK. Um, well, I feel, I feel bad about leaving people behind, I guess. Um, but if, if you 
are super frustrated with doing this or just don't want to, um, there is in this little time of the JL a working version of all these functions um, that you can just use. Uh, working in the sense that I wrote them last night and checked them and they do seem to work. Um, <coughs> so if you want, you can go through and look at those uh, and be like, hmm, why is it this way and not the other way? Uh, and that might also be instructive. Um, or if you just want to copy paste and keep moving, that's fine as well. Um, so one thing we could do to check um, that everything works is to make sure that the answer we get for like the energies matches between our three functions. Um, and if you want to, you can also go look up, uh, after this ends, a bunch of predictions for what the energy of the Heisenberg model should be and <laughs> compute it. Uh, a good thing, well, not good, but an interesting thing to Google in this situation, um, I will just add this here, is um, check that your energies match the beta ansatz. Uh, for anyone who really likes, for people who, who like punishment so much, they want more of this after this workshop, you should look up what this is and check that your energies match it. Um, <laughs> but for people who don't want to do that and just want to do Julia stuff, um, uh, feel free to like copy the functions out of my timeevolve.jl, uh, giving a sneak preview of the next part. Um, function and that will you'll have all the types we need um, and you can actually even just move forward if you want with the uh, with the transfer field easing since that's the stuff we're going to use next um, okay anybody who really wants to stick with this part or should we keep going in the next like half hour a little bit So we can either I can we can either hang out here uh, if people want more time to keep writing their own stuff, um, or we can move on to the part that actually uses parallel goodness. Parallel goodness. Okay, cool. <laughs> nice. Um, so the next part, which I guess will probably be the last part, which is good, um, is to do a little bit more physics uh, using this code we already wrote um, and use some of Julia's parallel computing features. Um, deal with some module fun. Um, and exploit a little bit of linear algebra at the end of the day to make things faster. So what we've looked at so far are problems where the Hamiltonian, none of the things in the Hamiltonian, like this h or delta, depend on time. So now what we're going to do is introduce um, some time dependence to the problem, which is called, at least in our case, doing a quantum quench. Um, again, because we're going to give a really f fancy name to just having a number be 0 or 1, depending on what time it is. Um, uh, so, why would anyone care about doing this? Well, quantum quenches are pretty cool uh, because, um, so earlier we varied h and we saw that there was a phase transition, right? Um, and the thing that's cool about quantum quenches is you can, you can so-called like prepare the system in a specific configuration, quench by changing the Hamiltonian, and watch a bunch of like uh, information spread, you can watch correlations emerge, um, and it's also something that people in, in an experiment can actually do uh, occasionally. I hear sometimes people like to do experiments um, and tell you that your predictions from your numerics are wrong. Um, so by simulating the quantum quench, you can actually like talk to an experimentalist and be like, hey, if you turn on the magnet at this time, what do you observe? Um, and you can say, my simulation is this. Uh, and then at the end of the day, uh, they'll tell you that your simulation is wrong, which you knew, but you didn't know how wrong it was. Um, <laughs> Um, or sometimes, uh, actually, even more disturbing is that your simulation uh, works better than their experiment, which is also <laughs> depressing. Um, and then you're not really sure if which one of you is wrong, and the answer is usually both. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so we're going to do a little more linear algebra, the last bit, I swear, um, which is to say that we're going to take one of these eigenvectors and time evolve it according to um, this Hamiltonian. Um, so we're going to do like the simplest time evolution case where we just turn on a static field at time equals zero and then watch what happens. Um, so the nice thing about this is that uh, our eigenvector is going to obey so-called unitary time evolution where you just apply some time dependent matrix to it like you literally just multiply some matrix by this vector and that will propagate it forward in time which is cool. Um, and that matrix that we're going to multiply by is this 
this blob right here. Um, it's going to be uh, the matrix exponent of minus i times t times h hat. Um, so this we got to be a little bit careful with. Um, so this works as long as we have like a, the Hamiltonian turns on a field and then doesn't do anything else. Um, so if our if our time dependent matrix describing the energy goes from like zero to one instantaneously, this will be okay. Uh, if it doesn't do that, you got to do something more complicated, um, and you can take graduate quantum to figure out what that is. Uh, but we're going to do the simple case because I think somehow people are probably tired of quantum mechanical linear algebra by this point. So we're going to just do something chill, um, which is compute this matrix uh, and then multiply it by our starting state a bunch of times to find what happens to it as we evolve through the quench um, and maybe make some pretty pictures and learn some things and use some parallel linear algebra. So again, remember, despite like this annoying notation I've written down, that this, this psi here is literally just a vector. And these u's and h's are matrices. So underneath all of this, again, is linear algebra that we presumably know. Like We can compute matrix exponentials of things. Um, and we can cheat using things we know about computing matrix exponentials to make the quantum mechanics a little bit faster. So uh, if you want, you can use my timeevolve.jl function that I included in the repo. Or if you want to use your own code, because maybe it's less horrible, um, you can nb convert your version of the notebooks and just steal all of your types and stuff out of them. Whatever you want to do is fine. Um, so in timeevolve.jl, uh, oh, I should actually open it in Jupyter. Nice, although it doesn't have syntax highlighting. Um, so you can see my version of all of these guys. Uh, whoa, the LaTeX didn't render very well. Um, so here's my, for instance, my Heisenberg type, um, which implements uh, the constructors for that, x, x, z. I didn't do x, y because I got lazy. And you can just set um, delta 0 to get the x, y model. Uh, so for now, what we're going to do is just focus on this transverse field easing model. Uh, and I wrote, I think it's in here. This is what I want. Um, this get ground state function, which just constructs, where did I put it? Um, uh, it is down here. So get ground state just takes a system size and a field. Um, it constructs the transverse field easing model matrix corresponding to those two numbers, the system size and the field, returns the ground state, which is the lowest energy state, and the matrix. Um, so yeah, if you want to copy that, um, if you're using your own code, or just include mine. Um, we're going to use this just as a little helper function for the fun part, which is doing the time evolution. So given a starting state psi, um, some Hamiltonian after the quench h, and whatever time it is after the quench, we can compute u very easily, because it's just the matrix exponential of minus uh, the imaginary number times t times h. And I've wrapped h in Hermitian here, just so we can exploit the fact that it is actually Hermitian, which will make computing uh, this matrix exponential faster. And then all we have to do to time evolve psi is just multiply this matrix, multiply it by matrix u, which is pretty sweet. Um, folks in the corner looking disturbed. Is this okay? Doing okay? Okay. Um, and then what we can say is for each time in some series of like times after the quench, we can just apply the time evolution operator to the starting state psi and some Hamiltonian h. Um, and we can use map to do that if we'd like. Um, oh, here? Yeah, it'll. Uh, <laughs> uh, there, there may also be a um, an opportunity here for some exercises involving making this suck less performance-wise. Um, <laughs> there, there is an exercise following making various performance improvements one can do. Um, but somehow, I think this is like slightly easier for people to read. Um, 
OK, so what we're going to do is just apply the time evolution operator for every single time in the series, um, giving some start time, stop time, and the number of samples we want to take. Um, so this is going to be really slow uh, if you try and do it for any big system size and any significant number of times. Um, both because taking the matrix exponential is going to take a while, and then doing the product is also going to take a while. Um, so the nice thing about this is you can compute each of these u's independently. Um, and the Hamiltonian doesn't change after the initial quench time. Uh, so we can actually just spread this work out a bunch, amongst a bunch of processors um, and use PMAP to do it. Uh, so here I've rewritten time series as time series parallel uh, by literally being the laziest person on Earth and putting P in front of my map. Um, <laughs> and then this is going to, given some linear space of time series, you could make this a log space if you wanted to. Um, sometimes you have to go to like exponentially long times to see anything interesting. Uh, but for now, we'll just use a linear space. Um, this is just going to feed in like time evolved to this specific time to the parallel map. Um, and then the way we actually implement the quench is we say, get the starting state um, where the Hamiltonian has a transverse field. So that's what this one is going to do. Um, and then our quenching Hamiltonian is going to be one where we instantaneously turn off the field. Like what happens if you suddenly take the field away and run, just watch the system time evolve? Time series parallel would answer that question for us. So if you go through and um, run all of these guys, yes, uh, you will see that we're going to get an error because time evolve is not defined. So this is the uh, the situation whoa, where you, if you were using Julia box. Hopefully, it's connected by now, since we're like an hour and 45 minutes in. Um, are people still trying to get that to work? Is it still not connecting? I was working with the GU authenticated with GitHub. Nice. OK. Um, hmm. Well, if you have a computer with more than two or three CPUs, it should work locally, too. Um, if not. Uh, I'm not super sure what to suggest. Sorry, there was a question. Yeah, I, um, I downloaded the like, time, time Yeah. in Julia 6 and tried um, running the get ground state with an integer. And it said um, there's an error indexing not defined for transverse field IC. Uh, can I come over and see what your error was? Sure. Sorry. I don't know. You actually run the gate? Yes. Okay. Um, although, can I see what you called? Oh, um, it's because it takes two arguments, also the transverse oh. field. So but like there was a um, default uh, yeah, argument, you're, so it should work. Yeah, it should. It should let me um, check really quickly. Hopefully, I committed the correct version. Oh, um, let me, sorry. Sorry, because um, this was working like literally an hour ago or whatever. Um, let me see if it works on my end. Uh, my computer also might like slow down and die at this point. Um,
so sorry, so sorry. Okay. Huh. Um, because the latest version I push should have this working. Uh, which version are you of Julia are you running? 0 0.6, right? Christopher. <laughs> the problem is when the matrix is trying to get printed, they have to see on the start three to try to print the matrix of the oh. and stuff like that. So I don't think the problem is with the computation, it's the printing of the results in the end. Oh, okay. So it's just when you do it in the red book, that's the error, but it's just from the code. Oh, okay. All right. Awesome. Thank you. Repl hero. Um, <laughs> yeah, so if you're. Uh, if you're in the if you're in the REPL, put like a semicolon after these guys, um, and hopefully it won't try and print them. Um, or if you want to be your own type definition hero, you can also extend base.getindex on this guy, um, on these transfer field easing types. Either option is very respectable and fine. Um, maybe you don't want to look at this horror show right here, uh, in which case the semicolon is your friend. Um, so these size t. Um, are the result are the what the ground state looks like at each time in the time evolution of the quench, um, where we've applied the quench Hamiltonian to the unquenched starting state for times between zero and ten with ten samples. So if you're going to run this yourself, um, feel free. Uh, word to the wise: um, the bigger the L and the more samples you take, the longer and louder this runs on your computer. Um, so like eight and 10 or 5 samples is a good number to make sure it works at all. Uh, and then if you have a cluster or something, um, you can go bigger. Uh, and then at the end of the day, we can, um, oh no, where did my size t go? Size t. Uh, we can compute the magnetizations and plot them against uh, the times we measured. Um, so this actually you might need to do. Uh, is that gonna work? Ah, oh, it's on our people magnetization. Yeah, okay. Uh, is PMAP working for people somewhat, mostly? Awesome. Okay, cool. <laughs> um, and where did my Ah, okay. Uh, so magnetization nominally wants a basis, um, and if you don't give it one, it'll complain. Um, so you can either modify it if you want to generate the basis in line, um, or just do what I am about to do, which is not good. Uh, generate basis. Oh, hopefully this plots. Um, This is going to be gross. Oh. Okay. Well, normally, this would plot the magnetization, but uh, I think somehow screwed up my default arguments, so sorry about that. Um, oh, you, like I did earlier, in fact. Um, yeah, yeah, I think I actually have a, like, a closure up here that does this, um, which I forgot to do for the minimization. Uh, where is it? Oh, yeah, it's up here, like this guy. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so we can do that, or it's not super exciting. Essentially, what you should see um, if you want to write your own closure and deal with my mistake, uh, is that the magnetization is going to um, go up with time. Uh, because we went from a s situation where we had the transverse field getting in the way to when it's gone. And so eventually the spins will decide to align with each other. And you'll end up with non-zero regions of magnetization, um, which is pretty cool. Uh, so this thing, you might reasonably say, is like not at all efficient um, for a variety of reasons. 
Uh, one is that we're building the Hamiltonian matrix on the master worker and sending it out to all of the children, um, which is not super awesome. So one thing that one might do to change this is to have the time evolution compute the Hamiltonian um, locally <laughs> for each time. Uh, in this case, uh, it would always be the same, so maybe that's not the best option. Another thing we could do is use something like caching pool, uh, which was what the next part of this was going to be about, but since we have 10 minutes, I think I'll cool it on that and let everybody go to lunch a little early. Um, so what caching pool will let us do is, is store between instant between runs of time evolve on each worker, it will store the Hamiltonian for us so we don't have to copy it over every time, um, which will probably make things run quite a bit quicker. And then the only thing the workers would really need would be the value of h at time t, which is always the same in our case. Um, and the other thing that we could do to make this a lot faster is not send the entire vector back, since the only thing we actually really care about is the magnetization. So you could locally compute that and send it home. Uh, and the final thing we can do is use um, kind of a linear algebra trick, since the Hamiltonian that we're quenching with, uh, which is the one with no transverse field, is actually diagonal in this basis of like zeros and ones. So you can use the fact that in a matrix exponentiation, the uh, exponent of some matrix A can be written as the projector into its diagonal basis times the exponent of all its eigenvalues times the projector into its um, diagonal basis, which is actually just the matrix of eigenvectors. Um, and by doing this, uh, you can actually like speed up this computation quite a bit. So one thing uh, that would be worth doing if we had had more time, sorry about that, is uh, to try different batch sizes for the parallel map. Um, this should also speed things up, uh, especially if you combine it with the caching pool um, and the linear algebra trick. Um, and then uh, finally, uh, another exercise which I have code for but didn't upload yet, uh, is since PMAP works asynchronously, so what it'll do is it'll phone home as it finishes each piece of work, you can have the plot of the time evolution be updated in real time, um, which is pretty sick to watch. Uh, it's also pretty cool if you do it for a bigger system because you like go get coffee and chat with your friend and you come back and you're like, yes, one more data point. Um, <laughs> and then the other thing that's worth trying is seeing how this scales with the number of workers. Um, and I guess if you want to go further on your own, you can try the quench instead of using the transfer field easing model, uh, using these other spin models we defined, this XXZ quenching into XY or Heisenberg, um, and seeing what happens. Uh, and finally, uh, if you really, really want to go for broke, um, so we did something that's like an instantaneous quench, also called the sudden approximation, where you just like turn the field on or off instantaneously. Uh, instead, you can change it so that the field ramps down really, 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 really slowly, um, adiabatically, if you want. And you can verify the adiabatic theorem using this uh, same thing. Um, and finally, uh, if you want, I've included a bunch of links at the bottom here to interesting properties of quantum quenches that you and your code could investigate if you so desired. Um, and I think we're about out of time uh, since Probably everyone is tired of listening to me and would like to get some food. Um, so the last thing I'll show you is uh, at the end of this last little bit, which was going to be about I.O. and which you can look at in your own time if you'd like. Um, but like the final going forward from this, uh, uh, hopefully everybody learned a little bit about physics, maybe more or less than I had intended, um, and a little bit about how you can actually use Julia to solve physics problems. Um, so. Ideally, if you are still interested, there will be some exercises you could look at. Um, and you can redo the entire process we went through here by adding disorder, where this delta in the XXZ model or our transverse field in the transverse field easing model um, are different on each site. So there you can do a bunch of crazy statistics uh, and basically be at like the forefront of, if you want, non-equilibrium physics in about an hour. Um, so that's pretty cool. Um, uh, this is actually what I, I do as my day job, uh, these disorder average simulations of these spin chains. Um, so I, if I did a good job, hopefully I've like prepared people to all come in and replace me, like people who actually know how to write code rather than just throwing a bunch of garbage on a screen. Um, and another thing that we, you might enjoy trying to simulate, especially with the plotting, um, is this experimental technique called spin echo which in addition to having a cool name is a fun way to detect topological phases. Uh, 
You might also try re-implementing all of this in two dimensions, although I will warn you, the system size you can access with exact diagonalization in two dimensions is pretty small. Um, there's another technique that would let you go to bigger systems called win tables, uh, which is, I don't know if fun is the right word, but it's interesting. Um, <laughs> it's a puzzle uh, if you want to extend this code to do bigger system sizes. And finally, if you wanted to use like another fancy Julia or um, Fortran matrix solving library, you can rewrite your types to, instead of like generating a matrix at all, just use the functions that figure out for each configuration, who can I move to? Um, since things like RPAC or SLEPC can work based on those functions. Um, and yeah, uh, thanks everyone for, for paying attention. Sorry for the growing pains. Um, and I hope everyone enjoyed themselves and maybe learned a thing. Um, thank you. <laughs>